distance. All right, we're going to get uh, started, and uh, when Mark comes in, he'll just <laughs> slot himself in and fire away. Uh, welcome to our annual Supreme Court Press Preview. Last year, I said that with the departure of Justice Kennedy, a big change was coming. It was only a question of how far and how fast. Last term's answer was not all that far and not all that fast. In part, that was because some of the most controversial cases were pushed on to this term. And in part, it was because the mix of cases left produced some strange alliances. Still, we saw two cases overruled with barely a nod in the direction of stare decisis, and we saw the biggest issue of the term by far divide 5-4 along familiar lines. I predict this term will be an even more so term. Probably not the revolution that some seek and others fear, but we will likely see a court moving further and faster in a rightward direction. The docket almost guarantees it. On the docket already are cases involving sexual orientation and transgender status, deferred action for dreamers, the Second Amendment, aid to religious schools, the prosecution of politicians for fraud. On the horizon are cases involving the scope of the abortion right and the constitutionality of single member independent agencies. So let's go to it. Uh, before we do, a word on procedure. After a case is presented, I'll ask if others on the panel have thoughts on the case. And then when that discussion's down, I'll a done, I'll ask for questions from the press. And we'll repeat that procedure for each case. We'll start with sexual orientation and transgender status. Title VII, Paul Smith. <clears throat> so, uh, at, at the risk of telling you all things you already know, the most watched cases of, of the upcoming term are probably the uh, uh, Zarda, Bostock, uh, Harris Funeral Home cases, all of which um, present the question of whether or not Title VII, the, the prohibition of employment discrimination in the, in the private as well as public sector, uh, which prohibits uh, discrimination based on sex, uh, should be interpreted as prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation and transgender status. The three cases involve employees who were fired either because they were, they, they alleged they were fired because they were uh, found out to be gay, or in one case, the Harris Funeral Homes case, the, the person um, came to work uh, saying, I'm transgender, I'm now a woman, uh, and the funeral director eventually came, came to the conclusion that that wasn't going to work and fired uh, that employee as well. Um, this is an issue that uh, has been percolating uh, starting in the last administration in the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. It uh, eventually started to gain some traction in the courts, uh, and there was great excitement uh, in the LGBT activist uh, lawyer circles in those years because having won um, pretty strong protections against any form of public discrimination uh, at this point uh, after the Obergefell case, governmental discrimination under the Constitution, there was this perceived great gap of protection in the private sector, uh, and there had been a failure over 20 years to uh, pass legislation uh, like Title VII to prohibit employment discrimination and other forms of discrimination in the private sector based on sexual orientation and transgender status. And the, so the hope was, let's get this issue up to the Supreme Court uh, while our friend Justice Kennedy is still there. And these cases kept getting pushed up to the court. And eventually, the timing did not work out so well <coughs> for those who were believers in extending the reach of Title VII in this direction, because, of course, Justice Kennedy's not there. Nevertheless, the arguments are uh, reasonably strong that um, Title VII should be interpreted to cover these cases. Um, of course, it, the cases raise this question of whether you should look at original intent in 1964 versus what the language seems to say, which um, are just interesting as a matter of statutory interpretation. The argument for um, covering the transgender case is, is, is that when you fire somebody because they went home as a man and came back as a woman, that that is got to be viewed as, as a uh, form of discrimination based on gender or sex. Uh, there's a, a second argument that um, under Price Waterhouse, uh, you are violating the prohibition of firing people because of failure to conform to the stereotypes associated with a particular gender. Um, the argument 
This argument is strong enough that in a constitutional context some years back, uh, the 11th Circuit unanimously found a violation of the Constitution when a, the Georgia legislature fired uh, an employee for coming to work with a different gender. Uh, a, a panel opinion joined by Judge Pryor on the 11th Circuit, a very conservative judge. So it tells you that there is at least some resonance to the argument that this has to have something to do with sex. In, in the sexual orientation context, the arguments are similar, although perhaps not quite as, as direct or clear. The argument is that if you fire somebody because you find out that this gentleman has a husband, that, that is firing him because of the sex of the husband. Uh, you wouldn't fire, or it's firing because of the employee's sex because you wouldn't fire a woman for having a husband. Uh, sort of basic sort of arguments of that sort. Again, the, the Price Waterhouse uh, stereotype argument can be wheeled out as well, saying you know, you really what you're saying is a man ought to conform to my assumptions about what men should do, which is not have a boyfriend or vice versa. Um, and on the other hand, I, mean, I think there's probably a, a little bit of an argument that it's a little easier to say, no, there's a difference in this context between <coughs> sex discrimination on the one hand and sexual orientation discrimination on the other hand, uh, especially if the employer says, look, I would fire a lesbian as well as a gay man. I'm not discriminating based on gender. I'm just discriminating against people because they, I don't believe in same-sex relationships. Uh, and, and so th that's the, sort of the terms of the debate. Uh, we'll have to wait and see um, what the court does and how it wrestles with this issue of text versus original intent of the Congress in 1964, which I think nobody thinks there was anybody in Congress in 1964 who thought this is what they were doing. Uh, but we have the, the on kale or on Kale case uh, in which Justice Scalia said we should follow text and not original intent. In this context, that was a case some years back about uh, same-sex, male-on-male sexual harassment and how that's covered by Title VII. Uh, and we will um, have to wait and see. Another issue, of course, is what do you do with the fact that Congress has debated this issue, of, debated adding this to Title VII or effectively adding this to Title VII for many years now and never passed it? Did you attribute any significance to uh, Congress's inaction in the face of the argument that we need to have this very prohibition? Uh, and does it make sense to reinterpret the existing law to get around that gap? Is that a good place to stop? That's a good place. So I uh, invite others on the panel who may have thoughts on this case to weigh in. Please. Yeah, I just think one interesting feature of the case, and I wonder if Paul has, has was surprised by this, but. Uh, if you look at the lower court opinions um, talking about this issue, one of the things that sort of jumped out is the fact that you have some interesting folks lining up in interesting places. Um, you know, this might be a, thought of as a, a hot button issue that would divide along political lines or aligns of the appointing president. But I think uh, in some ways the strongest opinion or one of the strongest opinions written uh, on, on the side of a narrower version of the statute was by Judge Lynch on the Second Circuit, who is not a conservative, not a not traditionally thought of as a textualist, where whereas one of the most prominent textualists in the country and sort of the founders of, of the new textualist uh, approach to interpretation, Judge Easterbrook, sided, I think, with Judge Wood's opinion uh, in favor of a broader version, uh, vision of the statute. So I think it's sort of interesting. That's an interesting fact about the case, and I think it, in some ways it it uh, it confirms that you know the the judges here really are working hard to apply their principles of textualism or purposivism, their theories of interpretation of the case, and it's not just one that is going to necessarily line up neatly on along ideological lines. It has been striking how the, the judges in the lower courts do not conform to the sort of normal uh, assumptions about left, right, and center. I mean, they're all over the map. And there have been a lot of judges who voted because we had these two on box, both in the Seventh Circuit and the Second Circuit. So a lot of different opinions, a lot of different positions taken. And Judge Lynch's opinion does sort of stand out. But it reflects this tension between can I really interpret a statute passed in 1964 to do something? I mean, in 1964, um, in most states, it was illegal even to have sexual relations as a same-sex couple. Does it really make sense that that statute could somehow leap forward and have this, this effect? On the other hand, the text, textual arguments are pretty strong, as other opinions, on, as, as Judge Easterbrook, for example, shows. And so I think that's where you get this, this strange alignment. Just picking up on that, one of the things that's been interesting to me is that I think different people just look at the text and it just strikes them differently. And that's just been surprising. I mean, I guess I you know, read the Judge Lynn's opinion and was pretty understanding of that view that on the text because of sex, that maybe it was going to be hard for textualists to get 
you know, to the outcome of, of, uh, the, of extending the prohibition in this case. But, you know, over the summer, we, our firm gave a lot of client presentations, right? And so we talked about this case, and I said things about, like, well, it's going to come down to what because of sex means. And it was just, it was really surprising to me that, like, audience members, you know, would be struck just different ways. Well, of course it covers this. Of course it doesn't cover this. Like, it just, it raises a lot of interesting questions of, like, what does because of sex really mean? It's rare that there's text that, like, textualists disagree about what it means. Well, one of the interesting aspects as well, it's, and this raises similar issues, is there, there's good law that says you can't fire a white employee for um, marrying a black person. If that's an associational claim that you're basically firing the, the white employee based on the race of the, of the person that they're, they're marrying or having a relationship with. And the, that argument tries to get extended over to this context where we say there's an associational claim. Uh, you're discriminating against uh, the, the, the same-sex couple because of the association that's going on there. But Judge Lynch, uh, in an argument that's also echoed in the Solicitor General's brief, where the Solicitor General is on the, the def employees, employer's side in this case, says that's different. That's obviously racist when you fire somebody for um, the, the race of the person that they're having a relationship with. But nobody says you're being sexist when you fire somebody when you find out they're gay. You, you, you may be being something else, but you're not, says the Solicitor General, being sexist. And Judge Lynch agreed with that. So um, anyone else want to weigh in? And if, if not, let me just ask one question uh, to Paul and then everybody else can comment. Um, do you see any possibility that the court could come out differently in these two cases, or do they rise and yeah. fall together? I, mean, I Actually, personally, my instinct on this, and Nicole is probably right that everybody just has a different take, is that the, the, the transgender case is a little easier for the plaintiff side, that it's, it's harder to separate uh, the, the reason for the firing, which is transgender status, from sex than it is to separate sex and sexual orientation in the sexual orientation context. I, I can imagine a world in which the transgender case comes out one for the plaintiff side and the, and the, the, the gay uh, issues come out the other way. It's, it's not unimaginable to me. Uh, can anybody imagine the alter opposite happening, or is that the... Well, sure. I mean, I think Paul's right that, you know, there's, that there are a lot of people who think there's a good argument that it's that the case for the transgender employee is better. But, you know, the Supreme Court's going to say that there's not a prohibition on discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, but there is on the basis of transgender status. That just doesn't seem like something they would do. Just because of where we are culturally on those two issues? Yeah, maybe. Well, I'd say... Be the reason for that, well, if the court does that, it will likely be because of this idea that 64 Congress could not possibly have conceived that. And if that's the rationale, then it's hard to imagine they'll say the transgender discrimination was within the... No, no, if they decide original intent is the, is the issue, which, I, which would be odd in some ways, but then you're right, they're going to go, the cases are going to be decided the same. Yeah, and the only thing, I mean, just, you know, I, I'm kind of with Paul on this one in the sense that it seems to me that, you know, I think the most Paul and likely, I, we agree on almost everything. Yeah, yeah, almost everything. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think the way you, 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 you probably get to five, if you can on this case, is to get, you know, start with the left side of the court and then get a textualist who just doesn't care <coughs> what they thought in 1964 at all. Right. And if that's the way you think you're getting to your fifth vote, then I think Paul's right that then all that matters is which is the more accessible argument just based on the plain text. And I think, I think transgender is kind of more accessible based on the plain text because, you know, I think on the sexual orientation, the kind of quasi-associational routes, you know, at, at, at one level, that's, you know, that's, that's an attractive argument for the plaintiffs. But it, it doesn't quite capture what they're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're trying to protect the status without regard to whether you're married to somebody of the same sex. Or, so so the, the kind of associational kind of piece doesn't seem quite as strong to me as just a pure textual argument as the argument that, you know, I, you know it, I mean, Paul put it one way or the other way. I've heard it put, which I think is, you know, potentially a, a winning argument for a textualist is if an employer discriminated against you know, somebody not because they were Catholic or because they were Lutheran, but because they changed their religion, would you say that's discrimination based on religion? Yeah. It's a good argument. And the, the trans and the transgender, there's barely a dispute, there's a little dispute, that the decisions there are based, are because of sex, right? The, the real dispute is whether certain sorts of categorizations based on sex, dress codes, restroom assignments and the like, behavioral norms, are 
nevertheless permissible under Title VII. Um, the, the, the government and the, plan, and the defendants don't do a lot to argue that it's not because of the sex of the <coughs> transgender employee, because obviously it's based on their biology. Uh -huh. Disclosure, I filed a brief to that effect in the case. Um, <laughs> and the real question is, when is discrimination on the basis, when, when is action on the basis of sex not prohibited discrimination? And that does have to do with the dress code issues and yeah. the exceptions that exist out there as well. Yeah. So um, let's go with the uh, questions. Yeah, start here. <clears throat> That's really an issue that would be left to the next case. I mean, there is in the, in the transgender case an employer who apparently has religious aspects to what what the decision was made, but that's not really the issue that's before the court in this case. Yeah, and the only thing I would say is I, I think where that issue could come in is I think that you know potentially one of the defendant's stronger arguments is you know not just that Congress didn't have this in mind in 1964, which everyone seems to sort of stipulate. But if the Congress actually sort of decided to address these issues squarely, it would have to deal with, like, do we have a religious exception? What's the scope of the religious exception? And all of those are, like, the important political case. decisions yeah. Yeah. that Congress never addressed in this act. And that's sort of a reason why, even in this case, to say that we're going to sort of limit the scope of the statute to what Congress had in mind in 1964. So that seems like the way you could sort of back into some of those issues in this case, but otherwise they're the next case. I, I don't think it'll be in the opinions, but I do think that, as you probably saw, a bunch of amicus briefs are warning about the threat to religious freedom and religious employers in particular, none of whom, by the way, acknowledge that they actually would discriminate in employment against <coughs> gays and lesbians, but put that aside. Um, and I think that's what makes the case sort of a political hot potato. And, and justices who might otherwise be inclined to rule for the plaintiffs on textualist grounds, for instance, this is probably the one sort of social issue that might be holding them back. It's the one movement issue that might be um, affecting the case, although I don't think that will come out in the opinions. Other questions? Yeah. Um, the <laughs> uh, and I'm wondering if Paul Clement thinks that that is what the Yuffin investigation did. I don't know that it will be successful in the end, but I mean, you know, if I were briefing that side of the case, I would I would have a site and I and I now somebody told me who was like at the moot court in the original sort of sundowner case, which is one way to get around the problem. <laughs> um, Said that it's a Cajun name and it really is on call, not on call it. That's a bit, you know, so for, for what that's worth. Um, but no, if I, if I were briefing that side of the case, I would have that on pretty much every page. Because again, that's all consistent with my belief that, you know, paradoxically, I, I, I think, you know, this is a case where, where it would be tough to get the chief's vote. Um, you know, maybe it's part of a grand compromise, but, but in terms of the way he approaches statutory construction, this, you know, this this almost seems like a King v. Burwell type issue, which is like, yeah, you know, maybe when Congress doesn't have the exact issue in mind, we'll just go with the text. But when the exact issue, like, happens to be like almost a bigger deal than the, what the underlying statute clearly covered, like maybe we should have kind of a major issues exception to on call. Um, but you know, it's harder to imagine a Justice Gorsuch thinking that's the way that you go about interpreting statutory text. And so because that's where kind of I think, you know, I, the, the maybe the most likely fifth vote is, yeah, I'd be, I'd be hitting the Scalia angle very hard. So just um, to put out the other side of on call it, um, the, the government and the employer rely on it a lot too, and there's that kind of famous line, I, I don't know if it's famous or not, but the key issue is whether women are exposed to conditions are burdened in a way that men aren't. And at least the government and the employer think that that particular line favors them. So I, I see Ancala as kind of a double-edged sword. Um, anyway. Yes, it did. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah, from Meredith. Yeah. 
How widely felt this opinion would be? I mean, it would, it would be huge for the LGBT community to have protection in the private sector uh, from employment discrimination, which is a pretty much a rampant problem to this day. Uh, and so that's the reason why it's been the number one um, sort of goal in the legislative agenda for the, for the community for a couple of decades. And to have that problem solved, at least in employment, it doesn't, wouldn't apply to other uh, aspects of private discrimination that, that are, people worry a lot about, like housing discrimination, but it would be huge for the, uh, for the uh, LGBT community. All right, so if there are no further questions, we'll turn to uh, DACA and Nicole. Sure, uh, so I'm excited to be here and excited to talk about this case because I think it's fascinating and I'm interested to hear what the other panelists have to say. It's fascinating to me because it has interesting legal issues and because a lot of interesting kind of legal strategy decisions have been made <coughs> and even as the case has gone to the Supreme Court. So first, to talk a little bit about the issue. The DACA program is the program for children who or individuals who came to the United States as children without legal documentation to be in the United States, who lived their lives here, who followed the rules that the government set out in terms of you know, being good citizens, not committing crimes, et cetera, et cetera and who under the DACA program, which was put in place in 2012, have had uh, the ability to stay here. So this is a program put in place by a government agency. It is not something that Congress put in place, which is important because now the agency says that it can get rid of the program. Um, in terms of the stakes, there are, I think, between 700 and 800,000 people who are affected who would have to leave the United States because they would not have a legal right to stay here. So I think it's fair to say that they're pretty sympathetic people, doctors, lawyers, people who have built their families here, et cetera. So this program's existed since 2012. Um, when the new administration came in, uh, the attorney general decided that the program was unlawful and should be rescinded. I should say that there's a little bit that happened before that point, especially that the government thinks is very important, which was the DAPA program, uh, which is a separate but somewhat similar program that was litigated up through the Fifth Circuit and to the Supreme Court. You might remember the decision United States versus Texas, an equally divided Supreme Court affirmed. And so there had been this question about kind of the lawfulness of a deferred action program like this one. So the new administration comes in. And the Attorney General uh, says to the, through memos uh, to the Secretary of Homeland Security, um, this program is unlawful, we should rescind it. The Secretary of Homeland Security rescinds it. Immediate challenges are brought throughout the United States by organizations, by states, by DACA recipients. The main challenges came up through the courts in California, in New York, in DC, and in other places, but I'll just focus on those three because those are the petitions that went to the Supreme Court. The California case, as you probably all know, was the one that was furthest along for most of this. And frankly, it's easiest for me to talk about because I worked on that case for a long time. I'm also telling you my slight bias there. Um, also, in the California case, um, immediately the government or the uh, DACA recipients moved with the state of California for a preliminary injunction. The district court granted the preliminary injunction. Um, there were also questions about the administrative record. The government went to the Supreme Court twice. Um, one on mandamus, which got denied, one on a petition for cert before judgment before the case went to the Ninth Circuit. Then the case went up to the Ninth Circuit, and interestingly, this is where the legal strategy come is, comes in. The government did something that I haven't really seen them do all that often, at least in my experience, which is tell the Court of Appeals, we already sought cert before judgment once. If you don't rule soon, we're going to seek it again. Hmm. <laughs> Not something that I've ever done, but um, I guess there was a strategic decision made there. And so uh, the Court of Appeals eventually did rule, but not before the government filed three cert petitions, some of which were cert before judgment, and said to the Supreme Court, this is last November, we want you to make a decision about whether to take this case. You know, you've already seen this kind of issues coming up to you several times. They affect a lot of people. This is a question of the president's authority. You know, you need to resolve it. Major national issue. So the cert petition sat around for a while. You know, they were kind of teed up in the December, January timeframe. And people were wondering, is the court going to grant review, especially is it going to do it, you know, last year? And nothing happened until the end of the term, where the court finally granted review and said, yep, we're going to hear these cases. And I think they're teed up for the November sitting. So they have essentially two issues as they go to the Supreme Court. One, whether the government's decision to rescind the DACA program is reviewable, judicially reviewable and two, whether the government's decision is a lawful decision. 
So starting with judicial reviewability, I mean, I don't know how many of these cases you guys have seen, but having litigated for the government for a while, when, I, when we told the Supreme Court that something was not reviewable, we uh, typically were not well received. The Supreme Court does not like being told, like most courts do not like being told that they can't review something. So, and that is uh, the courts below also rejected this argument uh, pretty resoundingly that the decisions uh, about the decision being non-reviewable. The government really had kind of two sets of arguments there, which basically have to do with um, them saying that this is a decision that's committed to agency discretion by law under the Administrative Procedure Act, and then a more narrow argument that went to um, prosecutorial discretion and saying that um, removal of people from the United States is essentially an act of prosecutorial discretion that is unreviewable. And for a while, they uh, relied on a particular provision of the Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, Section 1252G, which does say that um, courts can't hear decisions to commence uh, particular review proceedings. That was a big focus in the lower courts. It became less of a focus in their US Supreme Court brief. So first question, non-reviewability. Uh, that is a hard a hurdle, in my view, for the government to overcome to actually get the Supreme Court to say it's not reviewable. But you, know, you could see that being a potential avenue for decision if the Supreme Court did not want to review uh, the merits. Um, the second question, is the rescission of DACA lawful? So the arguments that were made and sustained by the courts below are generally administrative procedure type arguments, like this was arbitrary and capricious decision making. And one of the main arguments that uh, prevailed below was the challenger saying, look, the attorney general said that the reason for DACA being rescinded is because you can't have the program. It is unlawful to have the program. And that's just wrong. It's a discretionary program. You could have it, you could not have it. But if your decision, government, was that you can't have the program, that's just a legally wrong decision that courts can review and should be reversed. And frankly, you should have to come up with a better reason, especially because people are relying on it. You may recall the cases, including you know some that Paul have argued, that say that if the government changes position under the APA, you've got to explain that change in position. Well, that flavor came through in some of these arguments. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention by way of whether the rescission is lawful is it'll be interesting to see before the U.S. Supreme Court what arguments about why DACA was rescinded are in play. So the original rescission letter, there were letters back and forth between the AG and the uh, Department of Homeland Security, seemed to provide only one reason, which is you can't have the program. But as the litigation went on, the Department of Homeland Security was providing other reasons like maybe you could have it, maybe you can't have it, but there's litigation risk to having it because this DAPA program was held unlawful. And so we don't want to have the litigation risk. And then in the DC litigation, actually the DC court asked the Secretary of Homeland Security whether there were additional reasons and the Secretary of Homeland Security provided some additional discretionary reasons. Can you consider those reasons? Were they the original reasons? Are they the after the fact rationalizations? I think those are the courts that this, the questions that the Supreme Court will be grappling with. And then, of course, in the background is this concern that many justices have set out about nationwide injunctions. I think in probably all of these cases uh, where the DACA recipients and organizations won below, nationwide injunctions were being put in place. The government's had pretty serious concern about those. This is really an opportunity that, that they have to tee that up before the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's it by way of background, and I'll be interested to hear what the other panelists have to say. Okay, thanks. Uh, other people on DACA? It's well, a very, very timid panel here. Yeah, I was just going to say, but what's odd about the case is it seems like if the, if the uh, government loses because they relied on incorrect legal analysis, turn around and do the same thing the next day. You just say, here's our three reasons. And so that's got to be sort of in the background, I think, of the justices. Are we really going to go through this whole thing just for the kind of formalist APA kind of reason of telling them, well, your original reason is bad, all the other stuff you put in is too late, and we're going to make you go through the hoops all over again just to do it? Well, I, I, you know, that's one thing I didn't address, which is like the role of Congress in this, right? Like, let's say these folks want to have a legal right to stay in the U.S. Where do you get that from? A law that Congress enacts, right? That would provide it for them. This has been back and forth in the news. You know, will Congress provide a solution? Will it not? Et cetera, et cetera. And so, Paul, I think you're right that to some extent, you know, the DACA recipients are trying to buy time to be able to get a permanent solution from Congress. On, on sort of on, on Paul's point, Nicole, do you have any, any theories as to why the government hasn't more formally um, expanded its rationale or added to its rationale or, or sort of redone it in a way that they could say, oh, well, we think it's unlawful, but even if we didn't think it's, even if we weren't 100% sure about that, there's enough litigation risk and sort of embed that in the decision? 
Well, I think they have now. So, you know, the, the California case was happening, and then the D.C. case was a little, like, not as far along. And then the D.C. judge actually said, like, I think this has a problem under the APA, but why don't you give me your reasons? And then the Secretary of Homeland Security filed this new couple-page memo. So it's just a question of, like, are those post hoc reasons, or can you consider them? But, you know, I, I actually thought about this question earlier on in California for a long time, because it seemed to me like the government had such an easy argument, right? Like, this is discretionary. Um, we're going to exercise our discretion and not have it anymore, right? We don't have to, who cares if it's, we can have it or we can't have it, we just don't want to, and here's some reasons. And I think, you know, I always thought that part of it was because, you know, the Attorney General was responding to this um, fairly conservative legal position that the state of Texas had staked out in the DAPA case, like, you can't have it, which was a more hard and fast. And so my sense, and I, I don't know what was in his mind, was that he was kind of embracing that position originally. But as the case proceeded through litigation, especially with the involvement of the Solicitor General's office, that they recognized perhaps the same thing you did, which is let's shore up our reasons. And certainly their Supreme Court brief tries to do that. So a, a few quick things. First, I'll start with this point. I think the reason they've been reluctant to give these policy rationales is that they wanted to justify their decision on the law made what made us do it. We don't want to do it. We're in favor of the dreamers. The president said as much. But gosh, we have no choice but to do it. And to actually take responsibility and say, no, we, we have discretion here and are choosing to rescind it for the following reasons is not something they came to very reluctantly and sort of obliquely and after the fact and on page three of a, of a memorandum. And but having said that, um, as Nicole suggests, the government has no fewer than seven different arguments in its brief, the justiciability argument, two arguments based on the idea that DACA is unlawful or that the government could have, could have relied on that theory anyway, and then four policy grounds that were stated in this Nielsen memo. And I just, just so to get tamp people's expectations down a bit, unlike most sort of playoff series, the government only has to win one out of seven to win this case. Um, I happen to think that the vast majority of the seven arguments are not very strong at all. But a couple of the policy reasons that Nielsen articulated probably are, and therefore I think the case will turn, as Nicole suggested, on whether the court thinks those are post hoc, whether they're not fully articulated, whether there's, there's something fishy about that subsequent memorandum. I, I do want to just point out one, uh, two other quick things. One is, what turns on this as a practical matter? What does it mean if DACA is rescinded? It will not mean that these seven or 800,000 um, migrants leave the United States or are deported. A handful of them might, and all of them will be more nervous about being removed by a particular ICE agent that they might come into contact with. But in any administration, these would be the last category of, of migrants that you would choose to go after to remove. What's really at stake here is their legal authority to be hired, the authority of employers to hire them legally and have them in the, in the US employment system above board, paying their taxes, being part of the, the open economy rather than a black economy, which is a very big deal, and it's really what's driving this whole case. And finally, I think that if the court rules for the government, the most important question will be whether it rules on one of these other grounds, like a policy ground, or whether there are five votes to actually hold that DACA was originally unlawful. Because that holding, that broader holding, will mean that Congress would have to act again in order to protect the dreamers, whereas a ruling simply that the, that the Trump administration had the discretion to rescind DACA would mean that this is now a hot button issue in the election, and if a Democrat wins, that DACA is reinstated immediately. So the, the grounds of decision are very important, even if the government wins. Anyone else here? Uh, questions from the press? Yeah. Here, here. I know Marty has a theory about this. So. I do? Yeah. I thought, well, I'll give I probably I, did at I'll one give, point, and I told her, but I don't. I'll give it. Marty's theory then, that at least as I recall it, which is that they were waiting for the D.C. Circuit at some point. Oh yeah, that, so to the, bail them out. The D.C. Circuit heard argument on this subsequent Nielsen memorandum, and I think the court wanted it to weigh in on that, but at some point it looked like that. Who knows? But that was my th yes, I did say that to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
So, anybody who wants to weigh in on that? experts up here? I, no, I, I, I cannot predict what Congress would do. <laughs> That's probably but, how we all feel. <laughs> yeah, the boundaries of my expertise are already, we're already flirting with them, but no, that goes way beyond. I mean, it is getting a little late. Is it wouldn't I be would this say about that. It's getting a little late for it to be leverage. I mean, I, I do think the broader context is important where, and, and I don't, I frankly don't know, I don't fully know the status of the political negotiations that were in place when the policy was enacted, but obviously this has been a hot button issue politically and policy wise. I think the, there's an interesting broader question about the, the you know, in a, in a, if you have a political system that is having trouble making policy and presidents of both parties decide that they're just going to do it through executive order, I think that upsets the equilibrium maybe that the constitution envisions sometimes and that you have you have this sort of the, the the playing field being shifted over first to the executive branch and then to the courts and so this is seems to be another manifestation of of that um and i think that's an interesting feature of the case other questions yeah They'd probably reserve that question and say whether or not it was, it was within the administration's discretion to rescind it. I, I suspect. That, that's a way of avoiding the merits question. So, so, I mean, the government says that's what happened in, in, in Nielsen. So Nielsen, uh, as Nicole... The D.C. case. The, in the D.C. case, um, acting secretary um, Nielsen, the district court invited a new decision. They did not come back with what looked like a new decision. They came back with what looked like, here are the reasons why I think the original decision was right and should be followed. And among other things, they repeated the legal rationale, but then they said, and then Nielsen said, independent of that legal rationale, here are the following four policy reasons. And part of the debate is about whether those additional policy reasons are properly before the court or not. Um, because, in part, it didn't take the form of a completely new decision and can therefore be characterized as kind of an after-the-fact justification for the original decision or something that the district court, in its discretion, was not required to pay any attention to insofar as it went beyond the original decision. So... I it's guess a fascinating they're... letter. It's like three or four pages. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no. I mean, ahead. like you should read it because the language. It's like it doesn't say we're issuing a new decision. It says we were always right, but we're going to tell you some more stuff. Here it is. <laughs> um, okay, what am I going to do with that? I'm not sure if I'm the court. And I was on a panel a week or two ago with the Solicitor General, and he was asked almost that exact question. And his basic answer was, "We uh, that, was, that was you. You asked it. So you know, you should know the answer. <laughs> they th they think they can win on the uh, on the on the original." rationale and and uh you know so i think they feel yeah. confident with where they are they can fit, win on the original rationale uh well the brief they wrote doesn't look like they think that i must <laughs> say I, th I think they would characterize it all as being part of the original uh, the original decision that's very true yeah i'm just wondering if anybody uh, thinks there's any connection between the census case and this case and um, the fact that the Did anyone read the uh, UK Supreme Court decision this morning in the pro, right? The whole basis of the decision, it felt like the census case was, yeah, the prime minister has an enormous degree of discretion to which we will ordinarily defer. 
but don't give us a bullshit reason. Um, we're not. We're not. We're not going to accede to that. And you haven't given us any reason why you needed this long a prorogation of the legislature. You were obviously doing it to stop them from their constitutionally proper role. And so I do think courts, maybe our court, their court, are looking at executive. The executive is exploiting the fact that courts are generally deferential to it, and and have their lawyers provide reasons for things that everyone knows are not the real reasons. And that, that's actually a hard question for courts, when the court should look behind the surface of what an executive says is the reason in cases where that seems pretextual and, in fact, developed precisely for the purpose of surviving judicial review. I don't think it's an easy question, actually. I think it's a very difficult topic about when the court should call out the executive on those sorts of things. The problem here, I, I don't know what Nicole thinks, is that the Nielsen memo comes awfully close, to, not, in a, not in the best way imaginable, or the clearest way, to actually expressing what, they, what was really going on. And I think Irv and Nicole are right that it depends on whether the court wants to credit that. But, but I do think it, it does, to me, at least feel a little different from a, a sort of pretext type case. I mean, I think, I think it's probably all of the above. I, you know, I think they probably did think it was unlawful, and they thought that if they had discretion, they would get rid of it, and they thought that even if it was, you know, debatable whether it was unlawful, they, they would avoid litigation risk. It doesn't feel like, you know, we're saying X when really we're thinking Y, at least to me. I totally agree with that. I don't think this was litigated up through the courts the same way as the census case with like a finding of pretext or anything like that. It was perhaps just not a great job at giving the reasons that actually were the reasons. But, you know, for whatever reason, the initial reason that the government gave, which was the it's unlawful, we can't do it, was the reason that they wanted to press. And now they've added these additional reasons. But I don't think any court has found pretext. Well, and, and if you read the rest of the census opinion of the Chief Justice, the part before he gets to the pretext is incre incredibly deferential application of basic APA arbitrary and capricious standards. And so you might view that as more the, the preview here than the, than the end of the opinion. So it, the, the gist being is if this comes down to kind of ordinary APA review, uh, the government's going to be in pretty good shape. Right. As, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It is a little unusual for the Solicitor General to be arguing that the court should construe congressional delegations very narrowly to the executive. But that is the nature of the argument here. And you're right, it's intention not just with the wall, the wall case, but with you know a century worth of SG briefs arguing that delegations should be construed broadly to give the, the executive broad discretion. I hate to draw Mar Marty's ire, but I also worked for the SGs for a long time, and I think that this is potentially distinguishable. I mean, the, there was a particular issue in the travel ban case or a particular statutory provision that gave the executive authority that they were relying on, whereas here it really is, you know, not something that's covered in part of the INA, but in fact, like, discretion, the, this deferred action that, you know, Congress and, and this court has recognized that um, the government has that power, but I just don't think it's the same kind of statutory provision that was at issue in the travel ban case. So. I'm, I'm not sure that this is that that is the right um, criticism to make of the government in this case. Yeah, Bob. Do you think there's a difference between the DACA program and the DACA program that would give reason to the poor who voted against the DACA program to think this is different for all the other stuff? I guess I think, you know, looking back, thinking back on the briefs, there are a number of reasons which are uh, escaping me now, but I remember writing them at the time uh, for why the program, why the programs are different. And I think that they potentially are. But, you know, there's a certain amount of like kind of practicality to this, that if you're a justice who already looked at DAPA and you think this is like the same kind of program, although it doesn't have the same features, that you might 
you know, the whatever gut instinct you had with respect to DAPA might be the same gut instinct you have with respect to DACA. So, you know, that's certainly what the, the argument I think that the government is relying on. If you read their brief and they tell the story of what happened, you know, they're very different stories. The DACA recipient's brief says the story of what happened is we had this protection since 2012, and then the Trump administration came in and take it away, took it away with no good reason, right? If you look at the government side of the story, what they say is um, we can have these deferred action, or we have had these deferred action programs. This one started in 2012, and then there were immediate legal challenges to uh, something that was similar to it, DAPA, and then it went to the Supreme Court, and this happened, and that happened in an equally divided court, and so it's just a different story that they're telling, and the government story certainly relies on the litigation risk, you know, that they actually experienced with DAPA, and that they, th you know, potentially think they would experience with DACA. Adam. How do you reconcile uh, the administration's insistence that DACA's unlawful, they're running to the courts at every opportunity to try to get a ruling on this tax. And yet throughout this process, they never asked for a stay. And there's nothing China asked for the state of anything. Anyone? I think that they made a mistake and should have asked for a stay. Uh, it is it I think would have been difficult to get one because if you think about the factors. Um, that play into a stay. There's a balancing of the equities and the immediate irreparable injury to DACA recipients. And, you know, if you're working for the government and you're looking at the potential injury to DACA recipients and the balance of the equities, you know, what, you know, your, the government's position looks like, or the, the, the DACA recipient's position looks like a status quo position and the government looks like the position they're trying to change it. So I think it, it would have been an uphill battle for the government to seek a stay, but you know, probably in hindsight, which is always 2020, you know, perhaps the government thinks it would have been better to seek a stay. I mean, the weird thing, Adam, is that even though the session said it was unlawful, they said we're going to continue doing it for six months, right? So we're going to continue doing this unlawful program for six months. So it's pretty hard to go to the courts and ask for a stay of emergency when you're going to do it yourself for six months. I don't think that you know, I don't think they want to take these people off the employment books, only to have them possibly put back on six or 12 months later. It's, it's pretty tumultuous. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't have, I haven't followed this case as closely as Nicole has, so I don't have the same sense that maybe they made a mistake, but I do have a strong sense that, that would have been a very difficult argument to make. I mean, you know, it seems to me like the balance of equity goes entirely in the opposite direction. And I think that's why maybe they thought like cert before judgment was kind of a compromise. Let's do this quickly, but we can't really get you to stay things. It's just hard because having not sought the stay and then seeking cert before judgment and whatever else, you know, every time the challengers to the rescission have come back and said, you didn't seek a stay, you didn't seek a stay, you didn't seek a stay, you know, kind of poking them with that. Yeah. I think they would have lost a stay and that wouldn't have been good for the case. Um, so maybe it was a, the right strategic yeah, decision think, in Irv's view. In my view, yeah. Um, other questions on uh, this case? So um, let's move on then to, uh, why don't we do uh, Paul Clement, and you've got... Uh, sure. So I'm going to talk about the Montana tax credit case, um, Espinosa against Montana Department of Revenue. Um, so this case kind of has its origins in 2015. The Montana legislature passes a law that's a lot like a laws in lots and lots of states, which basically sets up a tax credit program for school choice. Um, in the universe of those kind of programs, this is a pretty sort of indirect aid program. It's like, you know, even more so than your basic sort of voucher program. This is kind of a second or third generation program where the state gives taxpayers a $150 tax credit if they make a contribution to a scholarship organization. The scholarship organization then takes the contributions and makes them available for scholarships at any private K through 12 school in the state. And so you do have sort of, you know, kind of multi-levels of indirection between the state coffers and the ultimate recipients at the private schools that might be religious. And all of that's done because of the intervening decisions of first the taxpayers and then the parents. So from the standpoint of any kind of establishment clause uh, violation allegation, this, this, this state program is, you know, I think obviously constitutional under Zellman and its, and its progeny. But 
Montana, like a lot of states, has a provision that is in its constitution called affectionately the No Aid Clause um, that was originally adopted in 1889. Um, I'm, I'm sure Montana <laughs> resists the suggestion this is a Blaine Amendment, but I think this is a state Blaine Amendment, um, you know, passed, you know, originally in 1889. It, you know, it was carried forward in a constitutional revision in 1972, and I think the, to the extent there are arguments floating around that the Blaine Amendments are kind of malum in se or the product of religious animus, uh, I think the state sort of, you know, relies a little bit on the fact that it was reenacted in 1972. I'm not sure if this were in sort of a race context that that reenactment would make that much of a difference. Um, I'm not sure in the end that the court's really going to want to wade into this um, issue, but you know that's sort of the, the 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 background that Montana has this this provision. The provision is, I think, you know, both a kind of a difficult provision to think that the state can have this program consistent with the state constitution, but then it's also, I think, a difficult provision to say that it doesn't pretty expressly discriminate on the basis of religion. Uh, in particular, it says that no, quote, direct or indirect appropriation or payment for any sectarian purpose or to aid any church or school controlled in whole or part by any church, sect, or denomination. Um, you know, I'm not sure much is going to turn on the specific text of this provision, but like I said, it's in, in the universe of these provisions, it's, it would be a tough one to, I think, for the state to defend because it's not just that, you know, a religious purpose. Um, it specifically says that if you give money to a school um, for any purpose, as long as the school is controlled by, even in part, a church, um, then that's prohibited by the Montana State Constitution. So confronted with that Montana State Constitution, the Montana <laughs> Department of Revenue adopted what it called Rule 1 and said, okay, we have this statute that our state legislature passed that purports to make these funds available to any private school in the state, but we're going to basically have a rule that says they can't, they, the, the money can't go to religious schools. So it can go to private uh, non-sectarian schools, but it can't go to any of the religious schools. And that, and that administrative rule one is what was originally challenged as violating the federal free exercise clause and the federal equal protection clause, and I think the federal establishment clause to boot. So the original trial court said that uh, that that rule interpreting the state constitution was in fact a violation of the federal constitution, but then on appeal to the Montana Supreme Court, the Montana Supreme Court uh, essentially said, you know, no, and the, the legislation, not just the rule, um, but the entire legislation essentially is invalid because of the state no aid clause. So kind of an interesting wrinkle on this, although as an administrative matter, the state is clearly expressly discriminating against the religious schools, the ultimate remedial holding of the Montana Supreme Court is to say, nobody gets this. Um, you know, we're going to take everybody's ball and, you know, go away. Uh, so nobody gets this money for private religious schools or private sectarian schools. Or secular. Uh, secular, sorry, yes. So um, the, there's a cert petition filed. The state makes a big deal out of the fact that the Montana Supreme Court decision effectively renders the law sort of neutral because nobody gets any money. Um, at least four justices are entirely unimpressed with that argument and grant the case anyways. Um, so, and I, and I realize I'm telling you all things that you probably know, but there are really two precedents that matter here, uh, both decided seven to two in opposite directions. There's Locke v. Davey from 2004, where Chief Justice Rehnquist writes an opinion, a very narrow opinion, that says that Washington state is within its authority to use its state constitutional amendment to say that we're not going to give scholarship funds that are neutrally, neutrally available to students who want to use the funds to study to become ministers. Uh, the court essentially says, look, even if this were fine under the federal constitution, sort of establishment clause concerns are at their zenith when you have state funding of somebody becoming a minister. And so we're going to have some play in the joints here. And the states can essentially be kind of more hawkish 
if you will, about Establishment Clause concerns than the federal government, so that's okay. But then much more recently in Trinity Lutheran, a different seven to two uh, opinion written by di different Chief Justice says that Missouri cannot discriminate when it hands out essentially funds to make playgrounds safer with respect to church playgrounds. Um, and the court has sort of the famous footnote three in that opinion that says this is an opinion about playground resurfacing. Um, <laughs> an interesting constitutional doctrine in and of itself. So, I, you know, look, I, I think that to me, the fact that the court granted this case probably tells you a lot about how the court is going to decide the case. I mean, this was not a perfect vehicle to consider this issue, and I think the fact that the court considered it anyways I mean, you know, tells you certainly what at least four justices were thinking, but probably what five justices were thinking. One of the, the only other observation I'll make before kicking it over to others is, you know, there's an interesting sort of path dependency, I think, in the way these cases have come up. If you go all the way back to the beginning, um, and the very first Wisconsin school <coughs> choice provision, the very first Wisconsin school choice provision was a pilot program that was expressly limited to non-sectarian uh, schools. Um, it was challenged on free exercise clause grounds, and uh, it essentially, that challenge went nowhere. So I think from the standpoint of kind of the mid-90s, the idea that, you know, school choice might not only be consistent with the Equal Protection Clause, but any state discrimination between and among the schools that are eligible for those programs would itself be a federal constitutional problem, I think was probably, you know, a non-starter in 1995-96. Uh, you know, you fast forward and it seems like there may well be five justices that are willing to say that if you're going to, if you're state and you're going to have these programs, you have to make it available to non-sectarian and sectarian schools alike. Um, that's a command of the federal constitution. Yeah, there's a little play in the joints there for the states, but not much. Um, I, I think you know part of the part of the explanation for why we're in a very different place is it's a different court and a change in personnel. But but I do think there's a doctrinal point here that does matter. Um, and you know then and, and I'll say you know I should have said earlier I filed an amicus brief on behalf of the challengers here. But I, you know I do think that once the court basically says that there's no establishment clause problem because. It's indirect aid. There's a circuit breaker between the state sending the money to the religious organizations. The money only gets to the religious organizations because of the intervening decisions of parents, et cetera, et cetera. Once the court says all that, then the state's interest, even in abiding by its own constitution, just doesn't seem very compelling anymore. And yet the discrimination from the parental standpoint is absolutely direct. I mean, at least, in, you know, at least in, when Rule 1 was enforced, you know, they have this scholarship and they can use it unless they've decided that the school they want to send their kid to is a religiously affiliated school, and then they can't have it. And so I, I do think one of the things that works against the state here is by virtue of those Establishment Clause decisions of the court, the state's interest looks pretty diluted and yet the individual interest in being free from discrimination seems like it's still pretty robust. All right, so others who have thoughts on this one? Um, let me just ask, uh, Paul, um, I, I, I noticed right at the outset you said, you know, this is not just religious uh, purpose, but it's also religious status. Do you think the, the courts would see a distinction between uh, one that was for a religious purpose and one that, you know, draws the line based on status? And if so, why couldn't this case be reconceptualized as being used for a religious purpose? Well, uh, so I think that they, I think they could draw that distinction. I think that might be a distinction that they want to draw just because, I mean, another way of asking that question is, you know, do you think they're going to overrule Locke v. Davy in this case? <laughs> and I think the answer is probably not. They might leave it on life support, right. but I don't think, you know, I don't think the chief is looking to unnecessarily overrule seven to two opinions written by Chief Justice Rehnquist. <laughs> and so I would predict that Locke v. Davy sort of survives this round. But, but narrow just to ministerial situations, essentially? Uh, essentially, uh, yes. And then I think the religious purpose versus kind of religious affiliation 
sort of kind of neatly works because the, the Lock B. Davy facts are sort of the epicenter of a religious purpose. And I think at least some of these schools would say, look, you know, and, and, and some of the parents, frankly, would say, look, this is, this is really about getting a secular education. I mean, you know, that's, that's why we're motivated to pick this school. We think it's the best education for wow. our child. You know, they might get, you know, one class of religion, and some parents might say, you know, frankly, I'd rather do without that. I'm Lutheran, and it's a Catholic school, but it's a heck of a lot better than the public school I have as an alternative. So I, I don't think, you know, I think the court could sort of set the case up that way, and I'm not sure it would be super easy for the state to just say, yeah, same, same, same thing. Um, other comments on um, this case? I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Roman. No, I was just going to say, it seems like a very messy case to take. I mean, the, 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 uh, for, partly for the reasons you said, and, and maybe just elaborate on that, it's, it's one of the oddities of the case is that the net result of the Montana court's decision making is essentially that there's, there's no, everyone's treated the same. No one, no one gets the benefits of the program. And so it's not, it's not like Trinity Lutheran where the, the upshot is, you know, we want to give money to some entities, but we don't want to give it to the religious entities. And I just wonder, I think doctrinally it probably doesn't matter because the reason that the Montana courts ended up that way is by enforcing this Blaine Amendment or quasi-Blaine Amendment provision. But I just wonder whether that weird wrinkle to the case might somehow complicate the decision-making process. I don't know, Paul, if you have a thought on that. Yeah, you know, uh, I guess I have two thoughts on that. One is I've, I've definitely, you know, I mean, a lot has been made of that, and I think the state, you know, probably plans to make something of that in its merits brief as well. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm sort of less impressed with that being a problem. It's like an atmospheric problem. But at the end of the day, you know, the parents still didn't get to use the scholarship funds because of the application of the state no aid clause, and the fact that sort of the remedy essentially created a lot of collateral damage for other people who wanted to use it to send their kids to, uh, you know, sectarian private schools. I, I don't know that that really like ultimately matters. And so to me, it's, it's a very good reason not to use this as the case to kind of revisit or, you know, to clarify footnote three in Trinity Lutheran and all that. But having this all been fully ventilated at the cert stage, boy, boy, it seems like, like I said, at least four of them yeah. are, are, are past that. And, you know, that doesn't mean you couldn't have sort of, you know, some compromise with five justices deciding to dig the case at the last minute because somehow that'll look better. But, you know, it does seem to me that, you know, this is probably something that has been fully ventilated at the cert stage. I, I tend to agree with Paul that it's likely that there's at least four and probably five or more who will get over that, who will f try to figure out a way to get over this problem. It's not that the parents don't have Article Three standing. They do. They were denied this tax credit. It's that the claim is that under the free exercise clause, as the court interpreted it in Trinity Lutheran, you, you need some discrimination. And the, under, in Montana now, there is no discrimination. If you go to a secular school, you go to a religious school, you're being treated the same. And so it doesn't seem like there's any constitutional violation at the end of the day. And it's th this rate, most of you know that this raises the specter of a very infamous case and disfavored precedent, Palmer versus Thompson, where one, a municipality closes down the swimming pool rather than, than allow it to be integrated. But it appears in law all the time of remedies. A state sets up a, a public forum for speech, and then a few very controversial speakers want to get in, and the courts say you have to let them in, but it's up to you. You can either shut down the forum altogether or let everyone speak, or similar sorts of things. You can either ratchet up or down. There's a famous Supreme Court case in the religion area where Texas was giving tax credits to religious periodicals but not non-religious periodicals. The court said you can't do that, but the Texas can either decide don't give any of the benefit at all or give it to everybody. So this is a pervasive issue in the law, and the Solicitor General's brief anticipates Montana and spends three or four pages trying to explain why this case doesn't implicate all of those. But I do think it would take a little bit of work, but I agree with you that there's probably five justices who want to want to do that work and get to that point by hook or by crook. And then, the, and then I do think, as the SG also suggests, that the court doesn't need to get into the question of whether a, a use restriction, you know, you cannot use the funds for religious teaching, would be constitutional or not, because the Montana constitutional provision, as Paul pointed out, 
is a, an identity one, right? It is a provision prohibiting money from going to churches and church-run institutions, not just schools, full stop. And the court in Trinity Lutheran seemed to think that there's, as Paul suggested, no really good reason for states to prohibit churches from being eligible for funds that are available to analogous private institutions. And, and that is, as Paul also suggested, I mean, it really is, this is something I'm writing on now, really is an extraordinary about face, right? A, a major change from the first 200 plus years of our tradition. It's not an accident that 39 states have constitutional provisions prohibiting money of some sort or another, not necessarily indirect funds, from going to churches. And it's not all because the, all of America was for 200 years anti-religious, right? That's not the reason. The original reasons for this... That's a pretty big part of the reason. I mean, you know, it's really, no accident that 39 states have these provisions. And they go back them, to 1776. Most of them, most of them the were enacted in a period in the immediate wake of the failure of the federal Blaine Amendment. And, you know, they are as anti-Catholic as the day is long. So, so that's just not true? Okay, the, true. the vast majority I, of know, them I, were enacted from 1776 until 1850 or so. There were, many of these states had these. As Paul points out, even the Montana one, which was enacted in the wake of the Blaine Amendment, was not limited to schools. It was more broadly a, um, with respect to all churches, most of which are Protestant, not Catholic. And in yeah, but it was really easy to limit it with respect to the Protestant churches because the public schools were teaching the Protestant Bible at the time. Yeah, but it goes beyond. So anyway. this was all done in an effort in these states to get after this idea that they didn't like all these Irish immigrants coming over and demanding equal treatment for Catholic teaching. I think it's fair to say that regardless of the merits here, more justices agree with Paul's account of the history than they agree with mine right now, or, or, or at least are worried about it. And I agree with Paul that there was some anti-Catholic animus that animated some of these provisions in the late 19th century that was unacceptable and unconstitutional. Um, but it is really striking that the, the reasons for these provisions going back to the founding, which were mostly to protect religious institutions, not to disfavor them, no longer have any purchase with the justices today, which is why it was seven. Which is why Trinity Lutheran was seven to two. They just that seems like a paternalistic idea now. If the churches want to be corrupted by the conditions that come with funding, that's their choice, and it's not no business of states to try to be erecting a high wall of separation for the protection of religious institutions. It's a very interesting shift in in the court's understanding and jurisprudence. Well, I have no views on the history, and I think that Paul's judgment about what the court's going to do is right. But I'll just add one thing, which I've always thought was super interesting about Locke versus Davey, which is this play in the joints language that Paul picked up on. And, you know, is there play in the joints in the First Amendment religion clauses, and what is it? So, you know, the idea was we don't, in Locke versus Davey, as I understand it, you know, we, we don't want everything to either be, either it's barred by the Establishment Clause, or you have to do it under the Free Exercise Clause, right? Like, hopefully there's some separation there. And you can imagine a view of the Constitution where where those clauses just have very little effect, like you can't bar someone from actually practicing their religion, you can't establish a state religion, nothing in the middle is covered. That's obviously not the place we're at. You know, we're at a place where the two are much closer together. But for me, as you know, someone who's not enmeshed in these issues, perhaps as much as some of the others on the panel, like that's the interesting thing to watch, which is what, if any, play in the joints is the Supreme Court recognizing? <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I mean, despite the healthy debate that Marty and I had, I don't think that's really how the case is going to go off, which is I don't think they are going to sort of, you know, try to figure out whether the, you know, so-called original sin of the Blaine Amendment, you know, is, is, is sort of the basis for invalidating them and just kind of wiping them off the books. So I, I think they will simply say that you can't use it to discriminate and, you know, they will probably limit the holding in this case to the indirect aid cases. Um, but I'm not sure that it actually stops there, which is to say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure there's going to be, you know, my, this is a prediction, obviously, but I'm not sure there's going to be a lot of sort of play in the joints left um, in the wake of this decision. Because I think, you know, if a state 
you know, if a state in a case where it was like a direct aid, but the kind of direct aid I don't think the Supreme Court would have any problem allowing. I mean, you know, sort of classic cases, you know, suppose there's like, you know, like some kind of, you know, government program that basically like is to restore a whole neighborhood that was wiped out by a flood. And so they give direct aid, they give direct aid to restore a bunch of private buildings, and one of the buildings wiped out by the flood is a church. And so they give money, you know, the same money available on a very neutral basis to all of them. If a state came in and said, yeah, we're not going to do that because of our Blaine Amendment, uh, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm out on a limb because I'm already assuming how they're going to decide this case and then how they would extend it. But I think, you know, the mood music of, of the court is that they would, they would probably say that that's just discrimination on the basis of religion and that's forbidden by the federal constitution. I agree with Paul on that. I, and I also agree that in this case, the court's most likely to take the narrow way to begin going there, which is the, basically what the SG's brief reflects. Is it about indirect aid? Yeah. It, it's just that this follow, if they get over the, the equality, the non, non-discrimination point, no, that right. this just seems to follow almost from Trinity Lutheran. And the only difference is that it's schools involving education rather than just kids playing on the playground. It does seem like it's going to be hard to distinguish at that point. Yeah. Right. And so it's not, they won't make it a use case. It'll just be you can't discriminate on the basis of church affiliation. And so that, that, that's that what the SG that, urges. And that's. Okay. So I'm, I'm just a little confused maybe with the answers, but is the gist of this decision going to be that there's a free exercise violation if I give direct aid to non-religious schools in the form of, you know, teacher aid or something, um, and I don't give it to religious schools. Not yet, but I agree with Paul that that will be the writing on the wall for the future cases if this, you know, with this court. Well, they have to get over right now. That's a violation of the Establishment Clause in many cases, not in the, not in the fire, well, under the doctrine as it, the precedents that are currently on the books, they'd have to first say that's not an Establishment Clause problem, and then they'd have to take the next step and say, and a state can't decide to do otherwise. Um, so the direct aid cases would be a two-step process. They've already taken one of the steps when it comes to indirect aid. So I expect a mechanical upgrade of I, I certainly don't think so, and this is kind of maybe part of my response to you know Marty. I, you know, I I tend to think that the sort of the the kind of remedial issue in this case is kind of less of a problem than maybe meets the eye, because I, I think this would be a different situation, and I think you know the court would have some real work to do if what had happened is you know there's like let's say there was this intermediate court decision that basically says um, you know under the state constitution this can't go to the religious schools, and then the state sort of said, you know, there's only like one or two private non-sectarian schools in the whole state, so if we can't do that, like, let's just call the whole thing off. And the legislature did that, and then there was an effort to kind of continue to sort of, you know, make the challenge that now the legislature's doing it, and it's all because of the religious animus. I think that's a tougher case than what at least I understand happened here, which is just, you know, <coughs> the state Supreme Court said there was a, you know, a state no aid problem, and then the remedy for that just happened to be to wipe out the whole thing. Although, although interestingly, the Montana Supreme Court purported to do it on the basis of legislative intent, severability, right? The legislature would have wanted nothing given a choice between just secular and, and, and nothing at all. So we're kind of close to that situation, but I don't think... I, I think there's a material difference, because I think one is just, you know, it's a direct remedial result of a holding based on a state no aid clause. So it seems to me it's easier to get there. Whereas, you know, so, so but in all, in all events, I think, I think that scenario where the legislature pulled the plug like before it got to the Montana Supreme Court is one step removed. And what you're talking about is two or three steps removed. I don't, I don't think. Be hard to show standing. <coughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think that the court would, in, if it rules um, as some people think it will, 
in this case would think if a legislature sits around and says, should we have a program or not? And they say, well, you know, if we have a program, it's going to lead to this result. And then so we, they don't adopt a program at all in the first place. I can't imagine that the implication of this decision would be that that's unconstitutional. And therefore, they have to create a program. Right. Yeah. Justices. <laughs> I mean, really, Rehnquist was famously weak establishment, weak free exercise, lots of play in the joints. Scalia was getting, was certainly getting there as well, right? Smith is an indication of that. They wanted to give government discretion both directions. And these justices seem to, they're not, I don't think that, you know, a lot of people are talking about whether they'll overrule Smith, the peyote case. The, I don't think they will. I think they can, they can invigorate the free exercise clause as they've been doing in Masterpiece and Trinity Lutheran and Hosanna Tabor without overruling Smith, just by carving out different little areas of protection. They are inclined to be weak establishment, strong free exercise. That's just where they're coming from. Um, and, and some of them, I don't know how many of them, truly do think that states, legislatures, constitutional conventions, administrators are extremely anti-religious and hostile to religion. And they think that that's a problem to be stamped out. I don't think they're right about that, but I'm not on the court. Yeah, and I also think just, you know, I mean, I, I think there's there's something to what Marty says about where Chief Justice Rehnquist was on these issues, but I also think that Locke v. Davey might have been sort of in the, you know, the, the Dickerson tradition of the chief keeping a case just to write it very narrowly, and if that's in fact what he did, you know, his former law clerk has taken full advantage of the fact that Locke v. Davey is written very narrowly. Other questions? Okay, so uh, let's move on to Ramon and... Sure, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the the uh, Bridgegate case, but first just a quick word on the criminal docket. I think um, there are a lot of criminal cases on the docket for this term. You know, I, I was looking at the SCOTUS blog uh, rundown that Rory Little says that 20 of the 50 cases that have been granted are criminal cases. I think that sort of depends on how you characterize them, but there's certainly a lot of them. Uh, I think in the first day or the first week of the term, there are going to be a couple of big ones, including the the case about whether the uh, you, there's a unanimous jury requirement that's in fully incorporated against the states that has potentially very significant ram practical ramifications. Um, the Collar versus Kansas case about whether states can ab abolish the insanity defense. Um, there's also the case about the D.C. sniper and uh, life without parole sentences given to juveniles. To me, the most interesting criminal case of the term is the uh, is the Kelly case, the Bridgegate case, um, which I'm sure many of you uh, remember very uh, all the all the the gory details. Um, so this is about the the prosecution of senior uh, Christie administration officials in New Jersey and senior Port Authority officials who famously adjusted the traffic lines uh, from New Jersey heading onto the George Washington Bridge into New York uh, in order to create traffic problems for the town of Fort Lee because the mayor of Fort Lee had uh, gotten on the wrong side of Governor Christie. I think he didn't endorse him in the previous election. And so that's kind of what the dispute is about, but really I think the case is about the, the scope of the federal fraud statutes. Uh, the government charged this case as a fraud, as a mail and wire fraud case under a money or property theory of, of fraud. And so the case is going to be sort of the next in a, a longer line of cases addressing, you know, how, how aggressive, creative uh, can prosecutors be when <coughs> charging those statutes, how broad uh, are those statutes. So just to go back to the facts briefly, I think the, the, uh, the, the basic layout is there are 12 lanes going from New Jersey on the, onto the GW Bridge into New York. Usually, uh, by some sort of political agreement reached a long time ago, three of those lanes had traditionally been reserved for the town of Fort Lee and for traffic coming from Fort Lee onto the bridge. Uh, because of the dispute with the mayor of Fort Lee, 
senior uh, Christie administration officials and, and one of the sort of New Jersey appointees, at the, a senior official at the Port Authority, decided that they were going to conduct a quote unquote traffic study, <coughs> that's what they called it, um, which was instead of giving three lanes to Fort Lee, they were going to give one lane to Fort Lee. And that gave rise, I think, to the, the, uh, the infamous email or whatever it was, uh, time for some traffic problems in Fort Lee, and <coughs> the, uh, the co-conspirators um, said. So they implemented this policy. The predictable result was that there was massive traffic in Fort Lee. There was, you know, the, the, everything was backed up. It was a total disaster uh, for, for the residents of Fort Lee. And a few days later, it was fixed. Um, once the, the investigation sort of happened and, and the, the facts came out, that uh, that this was really done for a political purpose, not for a, the purposes of a legitimate traffic study, the U.S. government decided to prosecute the officials involved for uh, for committing mail and wire fraud. And their theory, their charging theory, was pretty creative. They basically said to 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 establish mail or wire fraud, uh, you have to show that there was a deprivation of money or property. Um, and so they said that the property here was the, the right to essentially control the traffic lanes, that basically the officials had told lies both internally and to the public about what they were doing, why they were doing it, and they had done that to de deprive the state of New Jersey of its, of its proper legitimate allocation of the traffic lanes. It also deprived them of property in the form of the wages and salaries of the officials that were involved in conducting this phony uh, traffic study. And essentially, that was, that was basically their theory. The jury convicted them. The Third Circuit affirmed. Uh, Jones Day, representing the, uh, one of the two officials, uh, filed sort of the lead cert petition in this case. And the, the interesting thing about the cert petition and now their merits brief, which has been filed, is it it's basically leads with a major policy argument. Um, and the whole theme of the brief is that this cannot possibly be a federal fraud crime. You can't say that people, that public officials commit mail or wire fraud whenever their public reason for doing something is different from their private reason, and their private reason is, you know, some base political motive, and their public reason is about, uh, is about public policy. And so they say this whole theory of fraud is going to criminalize everything. So some of the examples they give, if, if the Secretary of State opposed, uh, appoints his best friend to a senior diplomatic post, and he says that he thinks the best friend is the most qualified person, if the Secretary does not actually think he's the most qualified person, there you have fraud. If a, if a mayor in a small town orders that a pothole be repaired in a certain area, and he says, this is because I think this is the worst pothole in town, when really it's because the area is home to all of his supporters, that's a, a fraud violation. And the other example that they lead their opening brief with is if the Commerce Secretary adds a question to the census and he says it's for reason X <laughs> and really it's for reason Y, then he has, uh, under the government's charging theory, committed a, a federal felony. Creative. Very yeah, right. Um, so their, their main argument is essentially this policy sort of slippery slope, absurd consequences type argument. Um, and then in the second part of their brief, they explain why this policy argument uh, maps onto the doctrine. Essentially, what their their main pitch is that the, that the government needs to show the deprivation of a property interest, and they say that these the intangible right to control the traffic lanes. Or the fact that that federal uh, that state employees had to use um, some of their time and therefore uh, in theoretically a portion of their salary on on conducting the traffic study that that was not a deprivation of property from the state. So doctrinally, the case is really about it uh, is a dispute over what what counts as property. The government comes back and and responds uh, at least in their in their opposition to certiorari, which did not carry the day. Basically saying, look, this is this is a different type of fraud, but it's basically fraud. You've got material lies that are being told to induce certain behavior and to ensure that certain behavior can happen, and the result of that is to take away from the port authority, take away from the state of New Jersey its, its ability to to uh, you know to execute public policy on legitimate grounds, and that these were all this was all a pretext. It was all a lie. It counts as fraud. Um, so stepping back from all that, I think that uh, this is a strange case for the court to take in some ways, in the sense that there, there was not a, a super clear circuit split. 
Um, but I think that this case really should be seen as the latest in a in a long line of cases, uh, especially recently, where the court has been granting certiorari, probably with the idea that 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 uh, to to send a, a series of continuing and maybe escalating brushback pitches to the government about its charging theories. The cases that come to mind are, you know, the McConnell, uh, the McDonnell case from Virginia, the Yates case, which I had the great pleasure of arguing on behalf of the government. Um, the, Brilliantly, uh, the, I might. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. Uh, yeah, best four votes that uh, have yeah. ever gotten. Um, <laughs> Official is uh, a tangible object. I'm exactly. still on your side. One would have thought, thank you, Nicole. Yes. Um, that was the undersized red grouper it, it case. It was the best argument in a red grouper case ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> The uh, the bond case, which I think Paul uh, that was a handled, that was a where the government prosecuted uh, a violation of the of the statute implementing the chemical weapons uh, treaty, uh, and it was involved essentially a dispute over a a, <coughs> a mistress and some chemicals put on a, a doorknob or a mailbox. Very dangerous. Um, chemicals. So in all these cases, the court seems to be granting review, kind of because it 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 sees a statute. It thinks the statute has a clear a basic core application and it sees the government prosecutors uh, really pushing the envelope in their charging decisions. They're not take they don't seem to be taking these cases because there's a circuit split. They, they seem to be taking these cases because they think that criminal law is being over enforced. Maybe criminal law itself is, is on its face too broad. And so I think that the unifying principle behind those cases at least is this theory of, of you know, over criminalization and over aggressive prosecutorial discretion. I think this case probably fits in in, in that line of cases. Um, I will say that I, I, if I were back in the Solicitor General's uh, office, I'd be uh, not looking forward to this argument. I was with the, the SG on a panel uh, a week or two ago. He is recused in the case because he was at Jones Day and may have been involved in this particular case when he was there, but he did not look unhappy that he would not be standing up for the United States in this case. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. Anyone else on uh, this particular issue? I, I would just note that when, whenever I'm on a panel with Don Verrilli, he's always talking about what it was like to be defending the charging decisions of the federal prosecutors. And he would go around, he tells me, yelling at them in various speeches. And they all said, look, they, they could only reverse one out of 100. We get 99. Why, you're going to have to live with it. That's the way it is. Like, that seems to be the reality. Other press questions? Okay, I'm going to uh, talk about New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. Um, in Di District of Columbia versus Heller, the court held the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess a handgun for self-defense within the home. Uh, whether the holding or the logical implications of the decision extend beyond that or, or even well beyond that has been a matter of debate. Uh, since Heller, the lower courts have struggled with questions um, such as the extent to which states and municipalities um, may prohibit individuals from carrying guns outside the home. Uh, the court has refused to grant certiorari in any case presenting that question. Uh, up until now, many have speculated uh, that the court's reluctance to grant uh, reflected uncertainty on the part of both the left and the right about how Justice Kennedy uh, would come out. Uh, and so when Justice Kennedy retired, many anticipated that the court would be willing and perhaps even eager to jump back into the Second Amendment. And then along came this little case. Um, New York City generally permits possession of a handgun only if a person has a premises license or a carry license. A premises license generally limits possession to the home. Uh, when this suit were, was filed, there were exceptions, but they didn't permit someone with a premises license to transport a handgun uh, to a second home outside the city or a shooting range outside the city, even if the gun was transported in a locked container, unloaded, and separated from ammunition. Um, the restriction were challenged as a violation of the Second Amendment and on other grounds, and the Second Circuit upheld the restrictions. Uh, after the city granted certiorari, uh, the city and the state uh, changed their laws to permit persons with premises license to carry their handguns to second homes and shooting ranges outside the city as long as the handguns are locked in a container, unloaded, and it's separated from ammunition. 
Once those changes went into effect, the city suggested the case was moot. Uh, that motion was opposed by the challengers, and the court uh, denied the city's effort to delay briefing until that suggestion of mootness was resolved. Uh, in their briefing, the parties appear to agree at least to some extent on the methodology for resolving Second Amendment challenges. Uh, the court should look to the text of the amendment, its framing history and tradition first, uh, if those sources don't resolve the issue, but Second Amendment rights are sufficiently implicated, then the court should apply at least some form of heightened scrutiny uh, under which the city would have to demonstrate, at the very least, that any restriction is substantially related to important interests. So that's where the agreement ends. Uh, the city argues that text, history, and tradition demonstrate there's no freestanding right to obtain firearms training or target practice wherever a person wants. Any right is limited to obtaining the training necessary to use firearms effectively, a right not impaired, the city says, by its former restriction. Uh, similarly, the, the city argues that the right to keep handguns at a second home um, does not apply uh, a right to carry a firearm from one home to another, a person could simply uh, buy a second firearm and keep it at the second home. The challengers, by contrast, say the text, history, and tradition establish a far more robust Second Amendment right to transport or carry a handgun to wherever it may lawfully be used. Uh, at the second step of the analysis, the heightened scrutiny, if it gets that far, the city argues that the former restrictions were substantially related to interest in limiting the risk of gun violence. Um, the challengers respond that the city's other restrictions, um, including the requirement that any handgun must be locked in a container unloaded and separated from ammunition, uh, already adequately address any public safety concern and that this additional restriction found nowhere else in the country uh, adds nothing meaningful. Now, if the court reaches the merits here, it seems likely that it will hold that the restrictions, former restrictions were unconstitutional. Um, the significance of that decision depends on how the court gets there. Uh, will the court recognize a broad right to carry outside the home, uh, as the petitioners urge them to, uh, calling into question all restrictions on carrying a gun in a public place for self-protection, for example? Or will the court say the city's former restrictions are unconstitutional because they are so marginally related to promoting public safety than they, that they fail any possible constitutional standard Deciding this case and little else. A broad ruling would obviously have immense importance, uh, a narrower ruling, not so much. Uh, it's also unclear whether the court will reach the merits. Uh, ordinarily, a party that voluntarily changes practice in response to a lawsuit bears a heavy burden to show there's no reasonable expectation that it will resume its former practices if the case is dismissed as moot. The city says voluntary cessation standards, which is what those are, don't apply when the government changes the law, particularly when an independent government actor changes the law as the state did here. And it argues that the case is moot because changes in both city and state law give the challengers everything they wanted in the litigation. The challengers say the new laws retain several objective, objectionable features, uh, including a requirement of continuous transport and carve-outs that allow the city to prohibit non-residents from transporting a licensed gun in and across the city. And they say that neither the city nor the state can be trusted to adhere to changes they have made. The court is going to have to decide uh, this question of mootness against the backdrop of several recently highly publicized ep episodes of gun violence and in a heated debate between the two parties about solutions to gun violence. For some, this is a reason to dig in, plunge ahead, and decide the case. Uh, for others, sitting this one out may be an inviting prospect. Uh, the court has scheduled the suggestion of mootness for consideration at the first conference. 
Uh, at the same time, it is scheduled argument for the December sitting. It's always difficult to read too much into these things, but I suspect this means the court will push the decision on mootness off until it hears argument on the merits and expect the parties to spend at least some time, a uh, part of their time, on the mootness issue. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to the panel and, and particularly invite Paul to, to weigh in because I want to make sure I didn't overstate anything in one way or the other. No, uh, Irv, you did an admirable job of stating the case and even finding areas of agreement that I'm not sure I'd fully perceived before. Um, <laughs> the, the only thing you know, I would, I would say on, on this is you know, if, if, if the court does carry the mootness issue to the oral argument and does kind of like ultimately address that one way or another in a published opinion rather than just kind of you know dismissing it as moot without further explanation. Um, you know, I, I know from the press's standpoint that won't be the sexy part of the case by any stretch, but I wouldn't sleep on the mootness issue because I actually think this is you know probably kind of a more important kind of issue and maybe a more important issue because of the nature of the court right now. Because, you know, you, you do have a court that I think a lot of kind of left-leaning jurisdictions are not going to necessarily want to litigate in, especially after a cert grant. And so you can imagine a lot of policies passed by, let's just say, hypothetical places like Berkeley and San Francisco that do certain things, get affirmed by the Ninth Circuit, a cert petition is filed, the court grants it, and at that point, um, you know, a lot of pressure is brought to bear on Berkeley and San Francisco to just sort of pull the plug on the ordinance and don't get it invalidated for everybody nationwide in a Supreme Court decision. So, I, you know, I, I don't think kind of the facts of this case with a relatively kind of conservative court um, are just going to be kind of a one-off set of facts on sort of the mootness side of the case. And, I, you know, I do think they're actually, I mean, I won't completely like law geek out on you, but, you know, there are some really interesting issues about whether mootness is really an Article Three requirement or is really kind of more prudential. And there's also just kind of this sort of, you know, question about, you know, how, how does the court with its discretionary jurisdiction deal with sort of these cases going away? Um, you know, I think if, if you're a court of mandatory jurisdiction like the Court of Appeals, it's pretty easy to say, look, we got lots of cases, we got lots of work to do, so if the city makes the case go away, that's great. We got six other cases on the docket today, let's move on. But I think if you're a court that you know, spends a lot of time picking 70 or 80 cases a year to hear on the merits for you know, very specific reasons, um, and then you know, jurisdictions start sort of making some of those cases go away, um, even when they're not the party seeking Sir, I, I think the court may sort of view that practice a little bit differently. Um, obviously, you also have the, the, prop, the prospect of a couple of cases, or at least one case, where it's the petitioner that got cert granted, but now seems to be having second thoughts about that, specifically the Maui case. So, um, you know, it's kind of interesting sort of, you know, how a court of discretionary jurisdiction kind of views this. Do they view this as, great, the dispute went away, or do they view this, hey, wait a second, um, you know, this is kind of frustrating our review process. I totally agree with that. I think the mootness question is fascinating. You'd think that the Supreme Court's law would be super clear on that, but then when you find yourselves litigating the mootness issue, it's like actually not that clear. So it'd be interesting to see what they do. I think the other person who found the mootness question interesting was Senator uh, Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse. Um, so <laughs> as, as, uh, as many of you have probably seen, he filed a, uh, a, a uh, well-publicized amicus brief that uh, that purported to be a, come as a friend of the court, but you know the Wall Street Journal said it was an enemy of the court brief. It it said the Supreme Court is not well. Uh, it explained why at great length, and then said that perhaps the court can heal itself before the public demands it be restructured, in order to reduce the influence of politics. So I, I think that's you know you don't have to law, be a total law nerd and, and get into this case because the mootness issues. You can also appreciate the political dynamic here in play as well. I mean, I think if, if the court is having some of the concerns that Paul talked about, about liberal jurisdictions sort of manipulating the docket and that sort of thing, being told that, that if they don't d dismiss this moot, they're showing that they're completely out of control by Senator Whitehouse. It's not exactly going to help, I wouldn't think. Yeah, normally the court doesn't like to be told what to do or threatened. That's just a rule of thumb. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I'm wondering why you think 
peculiar law, applicable only in most cases. Were they so desperate to get to the gun issue that they just grabbed the first thing that came along, knowing that there are other must carry, or I mean, uh, open carry, uh, carry outside the home cases coming along? Why did this? Well, it's a super weird law. I mean, it was so restrictive. And you know, sometimes they take cases just because they seem crazy. Uh, but maybe you're right. It, it's, the other theory, of course, is that this is a, a case that came at the right time with a different court. I don't know. Can I just ask whether there is a carry or an open carry or a closed carry or an exclusive carry law? Is that true in Michigan? Is there a I, I think at this point there's at least one petition on you know sort of a more sort of standard carry challenge that's fully briefed that's New Jersey so I, I mean why is this case granted you know because four justices think that this law is unconstitutional is you know the first reason and the the second reason it seems to me is if, if you're somebody like uh, the chief um, this is a case that gives you options about whether to proceed slowly or rather whether to proceed uh, you know at a medium speed or whether to proceed you know aggressively and I, I think that you know the chief more than anyone else likes options on the table and if you just had a carry look case before you it's like okay we've got to decide <coughs> now and whereas if you have a case like this you can you know, figure you're going to have a pretty easy time on the merits, but you've got a lot of options about how to write the opinion um, so it doesn't, you know, splash down and decide everything that day, but, you know, maybe it pushes out in a particular direction, and maybe it doesn't, but you've got a lot of options. Does, does he want to what now? Oh, I see. Hear argument and then, you know, hold the other cases and then wait and decide what's happening. You know, I think we're in the, the realm of more speculation than I, than I want to do on this case. But, you know, it wouldn't be inconsistent with the, uh, his general proclivities to want to move slowly, uh, more slowly than some others might want to move on things. You know, and particularly in a, in, in election year term, so. I mean, I, I look, I, I think it's speculation. I mean, maybe one thing to just sort of say to sort of you know, kind of amplify maybe something that Irv was, was getting at is, I mean, you know, we, we may get further insight into the answer to Pete's question once we figure out what they do with the mootness issue. Because if they say this case is moot, um, there are other cases available in line, and then that might lead to the conclusion that this was just the first in line, and there, you know, there's nothing particularly special about it. Uh, on the other hand, if they found this case particularly attractive as a vehicle to sort of, you know, dip the toe back in the water of the Second Amendment after about a 10-year hiatus after McDonald, um, then there is no close substitute for this case. And, you know, that, that suggests it might work a little harder to keep it. So, so, so I think, you know, you'll be able to kind of reverse engineer what they were thinking when they took the case once you see what they do on the mootness question. Well, they got, they got two exit ramps, like Irv said. They really like options. So they, they can, they, it's, it's on the conference as like a fully briefed up motion. So they can, you know, orders list, you know, however 100 pages the long conference orders list is, somewhere in there, case dismissed is moot. Um, they can do that without explanation. Um, they can do a variation of that where they do it, but somebody dissents and, you know, writes something and it's a couple orders lists later. Or they can just deny it. Um, or, you know, Probably, you know, maybe the most likely scenario is they just carry it over. Well, they can't deny it now. Have to put it on the calendar. Sure, they can. 
deny the motion to dismiss, you mean? They can deny the motion to dismiss as moot, yeah. um, uh, uh, or they can yeah. grant the motion to dismiss as moot. I, I just think the most likely thing to happen at this point is they'll carry it with the case, which is scheduled for argument in December, and you know that way, not only do you get to hear from the parties about this, but then you get to ask the Solicitor General what the Solicitor General thinks about mootness, who probably otherwise isn't going to tell them what the Solicitor General thinks about mootness. And so poor old Supreme Court reporters have to worry at every conference about whether there's something there rather than finding out something after October 1st about what they can with this motion. That, that's a really good question. I don't know whether if, if they carry it over to the argument, I don't know whether they'll signify that. They'll or not. signify that. I mean, I, they would they would be kind to everyone if they did. <laughs> yeah, no, they, it, would, it would be kind to everybody. But if they, if they said the the motion uh, for mootness is um, deferred. Sure. To, be to kind consider to say this case consideration is here by on the held. merits. So they <laughs> they do that on, when they note jurisdiction, right? So they they'll yeah. say that the postponed, the yeah, postponed. postponed. right? Um, and so it would be nice if they told everybody yeah. that, and they could also say the parties should be prepared to discuss mootness. Uh, either that, or they could just pose it as a, uh, a qu the parties you know the parties shall address at argument the following question: Is this case moot? Or something? But yeah. Probably right. I mean, you know, and, unless they really kind of treated mootness after the argument in a summary fashion, which, you know, I've seen them do that in other cases. I, I, I'm not sure I think that's a likely scenario here, but, you know, there have been cases where there's like a jurisdictional issue. You get to the argument, you know, it's 25 minutes on the jurisdictional issue, four minutes aside on the merits. And then like a week later, there's an order just dismissing it as per want of jurisdiction. It's, so, it's not obvious that there, many of the justices will want to hear a big gun case this term as opposed to after the election. Well, who knows? Or maybe they don't care. We just don't know. So if you're That's lucky, you'll sign. get one of those. Yeah. Uh, all right, Marty on... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I know we're running late. I'll try to be very brief. So Irvin and I talked about, okay, well, what, which cases in the pipeline should we bring to your attention to make, you know, because they're likely to be something this term, and, and, and most of our candidates involve presidential power. So this is the other area of the law that I think, in addition to the religion clauses, in which there's been, or the, there could be a very dramatic shift in jurisprudence between what we saw in the Rehnquist court and the current court. Um, and so there are several such petitions, which we'd be happy to talk about a lot of them in the Q&A if you're interested. The obvious ones are, there's the case in the DC circuit involving Mazers, right, that subpoena to the president's accountants. There's a similar case in the Second Circuit involving um, Deutsche Bank, the, the subpoena to his bank for bank records. There are other cases. Roman has a really excellent petition on the question, not involving Trump, but involving the but that has implications, obviously, which is involving the power of district court judges to or, um, to allow the disclosure of grand jury material even outside the four corners of the statutory provisions. Um, about when when such disclosures are okay, um, there are obviously a lot of things that could come up this term, or that might not, and the election might moot out a lot of these questions, or maybe not. Um, but the one that I want to talk about, the one that I think has the potential to be either the most important going for for the long term, or at least be a bellwether, is a petition that Canon Shamagan has filed, 19-7, the Sela Inc. case that most of you are aware of, um, in which last week the Solicitor General acquiesced in CERT. And this is a case about um, whether congressional 
protections of independence of executive branch agencies or officials are constitutional and under what circumstances. Um, th that is to say it's about the unitary executive, something very dear to the hearts of many of the newer justices on the court, um, reflected to a certain extent in last term's Gundy non-delegation doctrine case, which is similar sorts of issues. This one, many of you are familiar with the issue because in the 80s it was a very big deal. The Reagan administration thought it had a sympathetic court for really imposing an, the idea that the Constitution guarantees the president absolute control over everything that goes on in the executive branch. And part of that control is the ability to remove officials if he or she believes just doesn't like the way they're doing their job beyond just the, the idea that they might be misusing their position or not doing their job, but just disagreements about policy, dis discretionary policy decisions or, or policy preferences with the official. And thought it had a sympathetic court, and in two cases, Boucher versus Sinar and famously Morrison versus Olson, not only was Charles Fried and the SG's office, the Reagan administration rebuked, they were rebuked seven to one in an opinion written by Chief Justice Rehnquist ultimately, but you could see the writing on the wall in the Boucher oral argument where Justice O'Connor was incredulous. They were pushing this idea, suggesting that it would mean, for instance, that the Federal Reserve would be subject to presidential control. That seemed like an academic question then, but obviously now it's not so much. I mean, the threat that some president might want to actually control um, the nation's monetary policy and to do so for politically based reasons is now a fa fairly acute sort of question. We can see what it might, what it might mean. This case involves the Consumer, um, Consumer Protect Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, which was an idea proposed by Elizabeth Warren, of all folks, and, and Senator Warren's idea would have a multi-member board just like most of the independent agencies, like the Fed, the FCC, the FEC, et cetera. But for one, one reason or another, when Congress came to um, enact the statute, it provided for a single director of the Bureau who is protected from removal. The president may remove him, or in this case, it's her. Now, only for cause, which Congress defined as inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office, a common formulation of for-cause removal protections, which basically the court and Congress has understood over the decades to mean not for policy disagreements, but, but for misfeasance or not doing your job or being, you know, being bribed or, you know, or, or violating the law. The basic thrust of Morrison versus Olson is that this question should be answered by looking to whether Congress has given the pre left the president with sufficient tools to make sure that the laws are faithfully executed. And that a for-cause removal requirement like this allows the president that authority, right? It does allow him to remove if the person is not complying with the law or is violating the law. But the president doesn't need to have the control over the discretion that that officer has. So this is being very frontally challenged in this case. Many of you remember that this issue came up before the en banc DC circuit. A very split court decided that it was constitutional. Brett Kavanaugh wrote the dissent in which he argued that because you don't have to throw out all the independent agencies that are multi-member agencies, you can preserve the constitutionality of their tenure protection but when it comes to single member directors, such as we have here and in only a few other instances in American history, um, that there's something special about that, that the president has to constitutionally have more control. Well, Paul, you, I have to hear your answer to this before you. I have to teach my separation of powers. So. But maybe you need to listen to this then. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, that that there should be the court should draw a distinction instead of going whole hog and deciding, you know, that all four cause tenure protections are unconstitutional. At the very least, just decide that when it comes to single director agencies, they are. Um, and that was that was Judge Kavanaugh's theory in his dissent in the CFPB case in the D.C. Circuit. As I said, the Supreme the the SG has now acquiesced in cert. The SG believes, and the director of the CFPB agrees that. The, the president's lack of control over her is unconstitutional, that Congress had to give the president more control over the CFPB director. 
And that's the issue before the court in this petition. I think it's very likely to grant. I think both the SG and Cannon tried to get the case on the long calendar, but now it's been scheduled for the second calendar on the October 11th uh, conference. Um, it's not a sure thing the court will grant, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if the court grants, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if there were five votes to, hold, to, to, to go with the Kavanaugh theory, at least as an entryway into a broader challenge to congressionally imposed or congressionally protected independence of agencies and officials within the government and a more full-throated attack on Morrison versus Olson, Humphrey's executor, and the like, although I don't think this case will be the case in which the court goes all the way there. I think it will take this, probably take this more modest step. A couple things to note about this is that like many of these areas, this is, right, we, we know these justices are living constitutionalists. This is not based on text or originalism, right? This is just based on a theory of the balance of powers between Congress and the executive. Um, and they are likely to, as they do in many of these cases, go off on a theory of separation of powers that is not by any means prescribed by or precluded by the text. The text just has very little to say about what to what extent the president has removal authority that can't be cut back by Congress when it comes to executive branch officials. Um, and interestingly, if the court does hold, I think, that, that the CFPB director has to be, um, that the president has to have authority to fire the director, remove the director, even for policy disagreements, the SG proposes that the court do what it's done in other cases, like the Free Enterprise Fund versus so-called Peekaboo case, which is simply to read the statute to cut out the four-cause removal protection, to give the president so-called at-will removal authority or absolute authority to fire. And therefore, the CFPB would continue, but with the overhang of the president being able to dismiss a CFPB director that he or she does not approve of. The irony, perhaps, is that if a Democrat were to win the 2020 election, this would mean that that Democratic president would be able to fire President Trump's appointed CFPB director, Kathy Kraninger, who right now is entitled to serve out her entire five-year term until the end of 2023. So in the immediate instance, it might mean that a Democratic president might get more control over the CFPB for the first three years of his or her administration, but that's getting way ahead of ourselves. And I don't think the court is particularly cares that much about the next three years of the CFPB. Um, I think that, I think I'll open it up to the panel since we're past our our witching hour here. I have more so, to say, but um, so uh, in light of the time constraints, um, um, so I have for people who would like to stay, uh, I have the abortion cases that I'm willing to talk about. For those who have other more pressing matters, um, you know, feel free to press away. Um, and say, so too with the panel. If you've got to go, you've got to go. I, I can and, stick uh, around and talk about the presidential power stuff if people are interested. Just yeah. in terms of pipeline cases, how likely would the court to take the uh, electoral college? The electoral college issue? Yeah. Which the issue? The Tenth Circuit case? Tenth Circuit versus the Washington State case on the face of the That oh, seems I, like I, a likely one to me. Likely? Think, because, I don't, well, the Washington State Supreme Court's on the other side. and But, but what's, what's the issue? What's Knowing the, whether or not the electors can depart yeah, from yeah, our bound? It would be good to know that. I just think until an elector does it and there's an actual challenge to an actual elector. Well, that's deviation. what the case is about. The guy was replaced as an elector in Colorado by the state of Colorado in the last election. I don't, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Yeah. I, I, I defer to Paul or uh, Irv. Any others? Nicole? Well, I think it's, it's certainly it'll get taken seriously given the timing and given the fact that the, there are two courts on either side of it. it. It ought to be something that the court would be worried about. It would be nice to know the answer. Other questions? No. All right, yeah. So if the Second Circuit and or the D.C. Circuit rule in favor of Congress, saying that, that the, either the, the accountant or the banks have to turn over, have to comply with the subpoena, I imagine that the president, in his personal capacity, mind you, will take a petition very quickly and ask the court to hear it, but this term. Um, they, they could decide not to, right? They could just deny cert. Um, 
I suppose, if they think that that's okay. Um, or they could be eager to resolve it before the election. Um, I have no idea what they would do. I, I really don't want to speculate. And on the merits, I think in those cases, the president's claims are exceedingly weak. I've written about it. But I don't know whether that translates into a majority of justices, a, a prediction about the majority, how the majority of justices think about this. I think if they adopt the argument being pressed by, you know, by Mr. Consovoy, Trump's personal lawyer, which is a little broader than the SG's arguments, which is that Congress doesn't have a legitimate interest in overseeing or investigating the President of the United States ever, that would be kind of a big deal landmark holding. And I can't see the court going there, but I can see them taking perhaps more modest steps to say, if Congress is going to do this, the following conditions have to be met procedurally and the like. I'm not sure. There's a, there's a lot of, what were you calling them, off-ramps that the court might take. But I, I sort of suspect that this one, the court might be reluctant to say, to, to cut back on congressional investigation power, because of course the shoe's often on the other foot when Republicans control the House of Congress and there's a Democratic president. Other questions about things in the pipeline, separation of powers? Um, all right, so I, I'm going to uh, do the abortion cases, uh, hopefully briefly for you. So uh, June Medical uh, involves the whole woman's health <coughs> case where the court invalidated a Texas law that required abortion providers to get admitting, admitting privileges at a hospital within 30 miles of where they perform abortions. The, uh, the court um, found there was no health benefit or virtually none and that it imposed a burden on women seeking abortions. Um, June Medical involves a, a Louisiana law that's exactly the same as the one invalidated in Whole Woman's Health. Uh, it, it appears undisputed that if the law goes into effect, there will be only one abortion clinic left in Louisiana, and no uh, physician will be left who performs abortions after 17 weeks. Uh, the district court invalidated the law based on findings similar to those on which the court relied in Whole Woman's Health. The Fifth Circuit reversed, concluding that the law did serve a valid, if minimal, credentialing function and it concluded that the various, doc various doctors' failure to seek admitting privileges was an independent cause for the burden that women were experiencing. And the Supreme Court, as you all know, issued a stay by a vote of five to four, and the petition is on the 10-1 conference. What will happen now is almost certainly up to the Chief Justice. I suspect there are four votes to grant and reverse, and if granted, four votes to distinguish Whole Women's Health into oblivion or overrule it outright. Uh, some have thought that maybe the chief will think a summary reversal is in order on the theory that he will think it's good to send a message that only the Supreme Court can overrule its decisions. I don't discount this possibility, but it seems more like wishful thinking to me. Uh, I think the chief would prefer, if he had all options available, to him to let this one sit on the docket for the entire term, if he could, and then decide what to do with it at the end of the term. The other possibility is that the court grants on 10-1, or shortly thereafter, and the assault on Casey begins. The other abortion case on the 10-1 conference is Box versus Planned Parenthood. Um, for many years, Indiana has required private, uh, providers to give women seeking abortion certain information that might persuade them not to have an abortion and to deliver that information 18 hours before the procedure. The court has previously upheld that kind of law, and there's no dispute about the constitutionality of that kind of law. Uh, for many years, Indiana has also required women seeking abortion to view an ultrasound image uh, unless the woman objects in writing. Uh, women are typically, or were typically provided the ultrasound on the day of the procedure. And that requirement of ultrasound on the day of procedure is not challenged in this case. 
What is challenged is a new requirement that the ultrasound image be provided 18 hours before the abortion procedure at the same time as the rest of the informed consent information. The district court found this placed an undue burden on women because before they could get their informed consent information at any one of numerous convenience centers, but now they can only get them at four centers that have ultrasound equipment. So the gist of it is uh, instead of one convenient trip and one long disruptive trip, the new law produces two long disruptive trips. Uh, the court found this added burden was not justified because the state could not show there would be any additional mind changing from moving up the ultrasound date. The Court of Appeals affirmed. It seems very likely to me that the court will eventually grant certiorari in this case in reverse. Uh, putting aside the complexities of the undue burden test, it seems likely that five justices will see real value in informed consent laws and in having relevant information conveyed in time for a woman to have a chance to think over the decision in light of the information, uh, even if that causes substantial burden. Since the ultrasound is just another form of information, it will seem like common sense to those five that it should be delivered at the same time as the rest of the information. When this will happen is a difficult question. I suspect this case will end up on exactly the same track as June Medical. So, if the, so if the court delays June Medical, it will delay this case. If it grants June Medical early, it will grant this case at the same time. And if it summarily reverses in June Medical, it will summarily reverse in this one too. So um, happy to hear from all the other panelists. Uh, mine is, of course, pure speculation. Yeah, I have a question. It's a question for you. So I, I agree with you. Those are the options. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything you wrote, I, I understand and agree with. I just, I want the next sentence. So I'm, They I do mean, too. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I'm going to be wrong about this, because um, I usually am when I'm picking among three options that are like basically, you know, who knows. Uh, but so I'm going to go with the uh, kick it down the road option. You don't think so, there's any option of a denial in both? A right now denial, like we're just not ready for this? No. Okay. I don't. You know, I didn't. Did I say that was an option? No, I no, didn't. No, you didn't say it was an option. That's oh, okay. So I must not. I must Is not there a fourth so, option? Like, I cannot imagine four justices on the Supreme Court who got a fifth vote at the state stage saying there's not going to be a right to an abortion in Louisiana anymore. I, I just, I can't. It's just hard for me to see how you, and they could, and it only takes four to grant. Uh, how they could let it be denied. Yeah. So if, if they kick it down the road, what's the, the danger that would happen? I mean, so look, look. Uh, last term, what was the basis right. when they kicked every single? I don't know what what they did to to manage it, but they managed to kick DACA. When when did you say it first got on conference? Uh, like in December, maybe late December. So June, it got gr it got granted in June. The sexual orientation cases got. Uh, we're on For the whole term, right? the whole entire term. Um, that, so I, they don't have any problem doing this if they want to do it. Um, you know, I don't know what they say to each other, but. So these got uh, these got on rather late, um, la I think, last term. So there may be only four kicks <laughs> last term. Um, so I don't know. It wasn't ready. You're right. So June, June didn't get kicked at all. The other, the other case got kicked, what, three or four times? Why do you discount the possibility of granting the only Louisiana case when there's a possibility of a Louisiana case? And if I'm on the right side of the court, I'm going to let that happen because? I, I, I just can't imagine why I would. If I were on the right side of the course, said let, let's take June where we could lose and not take this other case where we can will almost certainly win. Um, so I just don't see. I mean, maybe it could happen, but I don't see why it would. Yeah. Kicking 
<coughs> yeah, yes, right. I mean, so I, I think it serves both purposes. How's that? Yeah. It would. Yeah, that's why I listed that as, as a possible. But, you know, the problem is that, you know, he, they got his vote at the state stage. Yeah, I don't know about at the... Uh, merit stage on June on June medical that's why it feels like for him a more attractive option would just be to say uh, you know the precedent is what it is and summarily it's not not yes yeah that's why that's an option it seems like an easier as opposed one, you know? to when full you can't say it's a precedent anymore he dissented after all right he can say I can vote my conscience yeah I mean he did um, uh, uh, vote to deny in the same sex case that seemed like uh, was controlled by a Obergefell, even though he he uh, dissented in Obergefell. And yes, no. So I, I, I feel like if the if there's summary reversals, I could see that happening. If there's not, then I'm not going to predict that the chief is going to be on board with the right. June medical. I, I'm very reluctant to um, say that Supreme Court cases can't be distinguished because they always can. I mean, the question is, what is can they be distinguished given the fairest reading of it? I think it's tough. But can it be distinguished? Sure. Exactly the same law, I said. And there's no doubt that it's exactly the same law, but under the test, the question is, you know, what effect does this produce on this record, and what justification is there for it on this record? And um, so you can obviously have differences depending on what the record shows. No, I don't think they said that, but I think what they did say is that admitting privileges um, um, don't serve any, serve only the most minimal, if any, legitimate purpose. And I don't think that's going to change, and I don't actually think the Fifth Circuit said much different from that. It said it served this minimal credentialing function, but it itself only said it was minimal, and the real action is going to be on this other part of the case, I think, which is, you know, does the fact that the doctors, are there findings about <coughs> whether the doctors could actually get admitting privileges? And if they could, then it's not the state's fault that they didn't. That issue could, you know, be more in play. Then the you know how how much of a valid state interest does this serve? Any questions? Any other comments? Okay. Time to go. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Irv. Good job, Irv. <laughs>